Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. So the county needs one more for a quorum. Beat me to my, my I was going to ask that question. Help me with the quorum. The city has got a quorum. Fantastic. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. All right, here we go. We have a quorum now. Fantastic. Since that is the case, I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order, our February 2022 CPMT meeting. And I need to read this statement. This meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with ordinance number 20-A16, an ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster. The opportunities for public access and to participate in the electronic meeting are posted on the Albemarle County website www.albemarle.org backslash community backslash county calendar. Participation will include an opportunity to comment on these matters for which comments from the public will be received. Okay. First up on the agenda, I think everybody's done introductions a couple times now, so we should be good on that front. Is everybody okay? Um, to just move on to the first thing. Great. Thanks for those lovely head nods. Okay, review and approval of the agenda and the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I move that we approve the uh, 
consent agenda and agenda as presented. I second. Time out. Did I do that? I have to do it for city and county, don't I? Separately. Well, we got city, so that's great. Thanks for the city. All in favor? Aye. Great. Any opposed? All right. Let's do then for the county. I move the uh, adoption of the consent agenda and minutes. Was that all I was supposed to <laughs> capture? Okay. Got it. I second. second. Let's marry with the county. All right, any discussion? All in favor? I guess it should work. And any opposed? Okay. All right, nice work, everyone. Um, we're gonna kind of jump into a couple points of discussion throughout our agenda today. And the first um, action item that we have to, to discuss is uh, a local policy change. So I'm gonna have um, Jennifer sort of tee that, that conversation up for us. Sure. Um, so you guys might remember last month, we talked about case conferencing and um, sort of a need to look at the current maximum rate that is set by local policy, which is $60 an hour. Um, and there was a lot of discussion around kind of what to do, how to come up with a rate. Um, and where things landed was that Katie and I were gonna try to draft something to send to you guys. Um, but I will say that that became a little bit of a difficult task just wow. because it wasn't super clear what we were really looking for from CPMT. Um, I, there was sort of conversations about just letting whatever the hourly rate be the hourly rate and not have case conferencing. It would just be included as part of what they're doing. There was a conversation about letting them charge up to 80%. Um, and so if we were to do it that way, like that would become a, a really pretty heavy administrative burden on our end to try to track every rate for every provider like that. So it's really, I'm not sure that's the most um, efficient way to do this. And so we just wanted to bring it back here today. Um, we sent out the local policy so you guys can see what currently um, is out there. And I think the reality is the easiest fix would just be to set up to a certain maximum. Um, and obviously if the providers submit their rate sheets for something less, that's fine. You know, the only time this really comes up is if they exceed the maximum that we set and that's when we would follow up with them to just say, this is the maximum we can pay. Um, and like I had said previously, you know, what I ran into with the providers that were having issues with it is that they wanted, I think it was, I can't remember if the maximum that I ran into was either 70 or 75. Um, so even if you set the maximum at 75, as long as they're at that rate or less, we're gonna honor that. Um, and I, I didn't really run into people saying, well, I want my hourly rate. It wasn't that, it was just that the current case conferencing rate just really isn't gonna work for them anymore. And like I said, I think it's just a handful of people um, that this is gonna apply to. So sort of making a plea for saying the easiest fix is just to change what you're saying the maximum rate's gonna be. Um, but again, it's your all's decision, you know, how you all wanna do that. And it sounds like, um, even though I wasn't able to attend the last uh, month's meeting, it sounded like the consensus was from the group that the group wanted to do something to acknowledge um, a change somehow. We just weren't, we wanted to acknowledge it or increase it by some increment. So that was agreed upon last time. We just didn't decide on a specific number. And I would just pr propose to the group that if um, this, the examples that we've had where this has been an issue in the past at 75 would maybe be a place to start. So maybe starting the discussion there, does, do folks feel like that's reasonable to change the case conferencing rate from 60 to 75 based on that, that was what was recommended from some providers before and whatever the, um, the language that is currently written in the manual or so it'd be like 75 or less. 
and that would be the same for mentors. I think that was, I'm, I'm new to the rate setting conversation, but I think last time we talked about the different, that there's, we didn't want to hurt the mentors at all since we, their hourly rate is generally lower anyway. Yeah, so what I was going to say, the way our current policy is written, it's up to a maximum of 75 or your hourly rate. So we would pay up to their hourly rate. So if a mentor is at 60 or 65, we would pay case conferencing at that same rate. So all that would really change with our current policy is the $60. We would change it up to 75 or whatever we feel it should be. The rest of it remain the same. And when would this go into effect after we vote on it today? Is there anything else that would have to happen after that? I think we would need to do it with next year's contract. Um, you know, we typically tell providers they're not allowed to increase rates during the fiscal year. Um, and then I think it would be a lot of work to go back in and have to change all the rates that we've already entered. Um, and since the contracts will be you know, going out and starting in June, it seems like we could wait until then. I don't think it's that urgent. Any more discussion? Is this something since it's a, a joint policy that we can vote on together? Okay, just checking. Um, let's do the county first. Is there a motion to approve the change in the local policy to raise the case conferencing rate to $75? I move that we raise the um, case conferencing rate to $75. Is there a second? Second. Other discussion? All in favor? Show of hands. Aye. All opposed? Any opposed? Okay, great. All right, let's do that for the city. This is Sue Moffat. I move that we increase the case conferencing rate to $75 for the city. Thanks, Sue. So. I second. Further discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? All right. Let's see, we have another action item to discuss on our agenda. We have a um, provider revision, so. Yep, this is That's for the county. That's back to you, Jennifer. <laughs> yep, so this is um, for Liberty Point. We have uh, a child we're trying to place there, but there were a couple of minor revisions. They're actually under the same parent company as Newport News, and so we've already approved Newport News' agreement way back when the fiscal year started. So the changes are essentially the same changes. Um, the, the one piece I did want to bring up to CPMT, which originally I thought that this child was going to be placed before this agreement got to you all, but um, that ended up not being the case. So we did have time for it to go through the county attorney and then to CPMT um, so that you all can approve these changes. But one of the things um, that we had talked about some time ago, I'm not sure if folks even remember, um, but there's sort of this dilemma of when we have um, a placement disruption, it primarily happens in foster care, where we need to place a child today, um, and CPMT meets once a month. If a provider makes changes to the provider agreement, our process has just always been that it comes to CPMT first for their approval to approve those changes. Um, but what we're running into is a need for a placement immediately, and there may not be time to bring it to you all. Um, so again, I would just point out, this isn't a policy um, that we have in place. It's just a practice that we've always done. Um, so one of the things that I just wanted to talk to you all about and maybe see if it, it needs to be written into some sort of policy for CPMT is just that 
if the county or in this or if the city, I mean, it may apply to you guys as well, but if um, legal counsel for, for CPMT agrees to the changes that we could go ahead and proceed um, with having that agreement signed off on so we could make a placement before the revision comes to CPMT for your approval. Um, so I'm just sort of bringing it to you guys. I'm not sure, again, it's not a, it's not written somewhere that we have to do it that way. It's just how we've always done it, that it came to you guys first, but it, we're just finding more and more that we need placements pretty quickly and there just isn't enough time. And we can't do like electronic voting with you guys. It has to be in, like through this means. Um, so I just wanna bring that to you all and see what, what your thoughts are about if you feel like there's a need to have something in policy or if you feel like you're comfortable with that um, and just kind of open it up. But so for this one, I am asking for approval. Like I said, this child hasn't been placed yet. So we do have time for this particular case. You just looking for a motion at this point? Yeah. Essentially, I mean, I think to summarize, oh, go ahead, Katie. No, I was going to say, I think that we, what um, the hope would be is that we get some sort of approval or feedback, and then I think we would need to draft the policy and then bring that forward to you all, and you could vote on that. Um, but it sounds like before we moved forward with writing up a policy, we wanted to make sure you all would be okay with, with that. Um, Essentially, it means that you know the agreement, the provider agreement has been has been. If there are any revisions, it's been reviewed by legal counsel, but not by you guys yet. If in the event of an emergency placement, so the process stays the same except when it's an emergency placement situation, and the need happens before we meet to, mm -hmm. to the group. So everything stays the same except in the case of emergency placements, but it's still going to be reviewed by attorneys as a. Yeah, a cover. and then it would come to you all still, um, but it might be after the fact if it's an emergency. So, so then would the policy have in it? Okay, so let's think worst case scenario, right? Because that's usually where policies go off the rails would be um, we build in a CSA coordinator. It's an emergency situation. It's reviewed by uh, a turn, county, a turn, county city attorney and the CSA coordinator in good faith, they approve it. It goes to CPMT and CPMT says, no way. What were you thinking? Let's just say, <laughs> right? Then would we have language in there to say on good faith, then it would be honored, right? And and then reset. I'm just thinking, right? If that, God forbid, that was ever happened, that we'd have language in there that would say we'd still honor it because that's in policy, right? For the emergency. Yeah, I'm, and maybe it, you know, it can be whatever you guys want your policy to be. Um, it can be no future placements there. It can be the case needs to go back to being reviewed by staff. The kid needs to move. Like, you know, I don't know how realistic that is really to ask the kid to move, but, you know, it can be whatever you all want that recourse to be. This has happened. What's that, that? How often would this happen that we could possibly be in this situation? We've had it come up a couple of times, um, particularly with yeah. residential. And we've seen it more, I feel like, in the county with, with foster care here lately, where it's been a bit of a struggle to try to find placements for, for kids. So what's the what's the catch? Like what's the what's the requirement in CSA policy? Like must all provider agreements be certified, approved by CPMT? Is that so I think the reason that it came to you all is because you're the buyer. So when we talk about these contracts, they're your contracts. And that's why we always sent these revisions to you all. So you know what you're agreeing to. Um, so like as coordinators, we don't sign any of these things. Your CPMT chairs are the ones that actually signing off on all this as your representative. And so that's why it's just always been a, a practice to bring it to you guys for your approval. So you know what you're agreeing to. Okay, so I'm just thinking, Beth, like our practice with a, a regional board, right, would be just that. If, if the person, it's reviewed by CPMT, but the signature is by this CPMT chair in an emergency situation, so parallel to our regional 
board, we actually give them authority in off season and during long breaks that the chair, right? Because there's someone of authority. So it's not putting the CSA coordinator on the line as much as a CPMT chair in good faith with the CSA coordinator and attorney, sign it. And then it's brought later for, hey, here's what happened during an emergency situation or an interim. So I think we could probably get language to parallel that. That I feel better with it. Okay, it meets the definition. Yeah, I like that idea a lot. And also it's signed off by our, our um, fiscal agent as well. So you have right. a third person looking at it too. Um, yeah. I, I like that idea of, of sending it at least to the CPMT chair to sign off on. Yeah, and that, that we could get. And then it would just be tiered, right? So if the CPMT, and I'm just thinking out loud, if it was like during some kind of break or something and CPMT chair wasn't available, right? Because we could work through that, but. Okay. Sorry, I got kicked out. Oh. So do you want me to work, Katie and, and Jen, at least to get to see some language that we've at least used? Parallel language? Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I could do that pretty quick. Okay. Yeah, we could put something together and bring it next month. Thanks, Kevin. Sorry for this interruption. So Lisa, there is an attendee over on the other side for participants. Okay, sorry. It's hard to type and pay attention. It's Michelle. And I'm, I just apologize to the group. I had, for some reason, I thought it was at 3.30. That was the, we just revised that time maybe two months ago. So it's still new okay. and fresh. Okay, I thought um, maybe it was like a memory lapse from five years ago. So that makes no, me feel better. No. <laughs> Exactly. I'm happy that I can provide some relief. We just changed it, I think, last month. Maybe even was like the first time I was doing it that way. So we're okay. This is a new thing. We just didn't want to, um, we wanted to give ourselves some buffer to make sure that we were done by five and some of our agendas have gone. Oh, no, lately. that's great. And that's probably what happened to Michelle too, I imagine. Hi, Michelle. All right, so the to-do on that is that Kevin's gonna um, find some similar language and provide that to Katie and Jennifer. And sounds like unless there was any opposition to that language or modeling the language that we would put that on our actions for next meeting to vote on that. Okay. Moving right along. Okay, so we have the review of system functioning and activities starting with the FAPT update. So Did we need to approve these changes though on this specific one or oh, we, yes. Right, because this was sort of a two-prong thing. <laughs> yes, thank you. So this is just for the county. Yeah. So you need a motion to approve? I do. I move to approve. Thank you, Mary. The changes. Yes. I can second. All in favor? All right. Any opposed? All right. We are good to go. Now we can do the FAPT update. Who would like to go first? I can go for the city. I'm making sure this is supposed to be me. <laughs> um, so I feel like in the city, um, I feel like we haven't really been staffing as many cases lately. I've been feeling like at least one week out of the month, we don't meet because there's no cases to staff. Um, so I don't know if just numbers are down at DSS, I'm thinking, um, or you know across the board, but um, that's something that we've noticed. Um, and we are up and running with electronic signatures now. Um, and I guess we'll need to talk about our continuing to yeah, um, yeah. and what that's going to, or how we're going to proceed with that. Um, I think we had talked about that a little bit in this group before, um, or if we would have some sort of hybrid. Uh, or what the pros and cons might be of doing that. 
um, we started to talk about it in FAPS um, when we thought the city was going to open before. Um, so we just need to revisit that conversation again and start planning for that. Um, right? And that, that's what we've really had going on lately. Yeah, uh, for the county, so we've not seen that. I feel like our numbers have um, been pretty steady. And so, um, again, like I feel like we've had a number of uh, Chin's cases coming through Region 10 and just um, seeing a lot of need there. And uh, foster care numbers seem to be going up. Mary, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but it, it seems like here lately we've taken in um, several more children. So, I don't think we've really seen that in the county. Um, obviously, we're continuing to do the electronic signatures for some of our forms, and that seems to be going fairly well. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say, we've got the FAP survey results that we sent out to you guys for your review. Um, and I think I think that's about it for the FAP update. Sue or Mary, did you want to um, add any additional thoughts or insight as far as the what you guys are noticing as far as what might be coming to FAPT or not coming to FAPT? Um, I'll just echo what Katie said that um, our numbers are just going down and uh, which is good. We've seen a swing where we're actually going to have more prevention or in-home workers than foster care workers. So that's a good thing, right? Yeah, I don't have anything um, additional to add. I think Jennifer covered it. Okay. So, um, did anybody have any uh, items to bring up around the routine foster care expenses and FAPT approved expenses? And what we're doing next is the CSA coordinator update. Woohoo! Um, Jennifer and I were just going to let you guys know about some things that we are working on. Um, so we are working on a training packet. The flat just, just released an acronym list that we are going to work to go through. Um, and we're hoping to have something like a stereotype example to um, share with you all next month. Um, we're working on that. And then the other thing that we have coming up here soon is um, the term for our private provider representatives on FAPT is getting ready to end. Um, they can serve a maximum three years. So um, we'll need to do some recruitment for that person on both the Admiral and Charlottesville FAP teams. Um, and so that we would need to be working on that in the next couple of months. But, um, you know, the Charlottesville CPMT and program has not had a parent rep for a long time. And so I was thinking it's a good opportunity to also try um, to maybe discuss and come up with some action steps in this group of how we can help recruit for that. Um, person on our CPMT. Um, it's always been something that we've struggled with. Um, and I'm not, you know, right now, the only advertisement really is if somebody were interested on in serving a board and they went to the city website and saw this opportunity. Um, so I just wanted to throw it out there and, um, you know, maybe just put it in your heads to start thinking about how we can kind of get the word out for that. Um, I know it's part of our, it's in our strategic plan um, document as one of our goals to work on. And before, you know, we had had some ideas about social media or other outlets that we could maybe use that we haven't before. So I definitely am interested in having more of a conversation um, around how we can really try to work on that this spring. trying to look through. Um, so we have the non-mandated work group. Uh, they're meet, we're going to be meeting next week. So hopefully we'll have an update for CPMT next month to bring um, for you guys for that. And then um, 
as part of what program's working on, like the UR mentoring that's moving forward, um, we've created our sort of uh, referral form. And so that's gonna be coming to the CPMT chairs to sign off on. So Ms. Dianita will be sending that to you guys for your signature as authorization to start that UR process for mentoring. Um, and then the other thing is um, something went out to the state um, CSA coordinated work group about whether or not your CPMTs would be interested in participating in a pre-conference um, during the CSA conference. And so the, they didn't share a whole lot of information. Um, they're, they're tentatively planning on this being in person towards the end of October. Um, they're thinking it's gonna be at the Hotel Roanoke. And so one of the things they wanted us to ask is whether you all would be interested in participating um, if they were to offer you a pre-conference um, that would happen. So like CSA coordinators have a pre-conference that starts before the regular CSA conference. And they wanted to know if CPMT members would be interested in doing something like that, where it's very specific um, to, to CPMT and your role in that. So I'm just asking so that we can take that back. They have not shared what the top potential topic or topics may be. So we do not have any more information other than would people be interested in coming um, to the conference a day early for a targeted session for CPMT members. That's all we know. Would we just come to the, that, that pre-session or would we have to attend the whole thing? The conference is typically two days, and then for CSA coordinators, there's a half day before those two days. So I'm assuming it'd be the same format. I mean, you can come and go as you please, um, but I think the thought is that you would come for the pre-conference and then stay for a day or two of the conference as a CPMT member, CPMT chair. And CPMT members and chairs have always been invited to the regular two-day conference. This is the first year they've talked about having a more targeted kind of um, session for CPMT members. I would be. I'm always hesitant about these things until you get to see the agenda. So uh, you know, I I don't think that's really fair. <laughs> yeah, it's a hard there, question to answer. So maybe we say possibly, maybe, depending on content. <laughs> maybe there'd be an opportunity to give suggestions for the agenda too. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. they're, I don't know, you know, if from air locality or if new CPMT members, I mean, there might be ways to make it be of some value if there's some hesitancy about it. You know, the I want to say, was it the last? conference the keynote speaker was really good and he was talking about diversity and equity and I know you know we have that built into our strategic plan so if it's something like that it might be valuable for us to attend um yes but it kind of depends on what it is I it, it would also be I think really helpful if there was training on how to make um the, rep the parent representative uh, in CPMT how to make that a meaningful role because we can recruit, but it's really hard to make it meaningful for lay people who are not in the system because of all the things we have, all boxes we have to check, et cetera. So I would love to hear how a CPMT manage to uh, do that and you know really have a parent voice for real and get all the i's dotted and the t's crossed um i think that would even if it's not the pre-conference that would be a good conference topic too yeah. so if you're communicating back our interests it sounds like a, a few of us would be interested and we have some suggested items that would be worthy but it would depend on the content that makes sense um so the other thing i will just throw out there if it is in person it's just to keep in mind like see if there's no money for us to pay for you guys to go like it would be up to you and your agency to pay for that um so just making sure that you're aware of that 
Um, and I guess I'm sort of question whether it may end up being virtual anyway. But, you know, as of right now, they're planning for an in-person, but we'll see. What um, month is it, Jennifer? Or they? October. they said they were thinking act like towards the end of October. Um, so I will share that back with them, sort of a maybe. <laughs> um, and then the last thing that I just wanted to bring up to the group is uh, just to, to kind of not lose the thread from last month where um, I had shared with you all sort of this struggle that we've had as a community um, in finding placements for, for children. Um, and so I thought Alice did a nice job of explaining that it's really not just a foster care issue. Um, it really, it's, it's larger than that. It's when you need to find a place for a child and there's just a real struggle when you don't have family that might be a potential resource and that and the other piece I'll point out is, you know, Katie and I are on the CSA coordinators um, group with the state, and it's clearly an issue across the state that people are really struggling with. Um, and so I just, again, I, do, I just don't want us to lose the thread of it because I do feel like it's going to be an ongoing problem that we're going to be confronted with um, and, and just trying to figure out what we do when we need these placements and there just isn't somewhere to place it. Um, so again, not that I'm looking for like the answer to the question, but just to, to continue the conversation um, and for you guys to be giving thought about, is there a potential resource you could think of that might be helpful? Oh my God. Hey, Michelle, I think you're unmuted. Sorry, guys. That's okay. So like I said, just kind of wanting to continue that conversation. I don't know um, if folks have given it a thought or, or need more time to think about it, but just really um, trying to keep that conversation going, recognizing that it, this is likely going to be an ongoing issue for a while. I mean, I know at least for the county, like we're struggling currently to find a placement for um, a youth. And so it's just that struggle and, you know, figuring out what to do. Um, so I just want to kind of throw that out there to you all. And you're right that it's a, across the state. Fluviana had a young man in a hotel for several days um, who's now recently gotten a detention sentence, but it's going to be the same problem when that brief sentence runs out. So, so um, we have some time to actually spend some time thinking through this. I mean, I think one of the opportunities to make CPMT meetings more meaningful and really capitalize on the strengths of this group and the perspectives that are here, I think it warrants spending a few minutes just thinking through what are the challenges and why this is happening, and then what are some of the solutions. Um, not only do we want to make CPMT meaningful meetings and utilize folks' time well, but part of the charge for this group is to keep our finger on the pulse of what needs are um, in the community and what are the service gaps. Now, we did a service gap you know, assessment not that long ago, but this is part of our charge, our responsibilities to be able to bring the things that we're noticing and seeing and then think through some of those solutions. Um, so um, sounds like, you know, when we first started talking about this um, and feel free to jump in folks with what they're seeing in their day-to-day -day, um, circles, but it sounds like, you know, providers are becoming more and more particular about who they will take and who they won't take. So putting up more and more barriers now to um, having somebody be eligible. It looks like there's increasing, increasing barriers to have uh, that providers are putting up. Um, looks like there are uh, providers that are moving away from accepting Medicaid um, is another challenge. Um, we also, from what I'm understanding, another challenge is that kids are really struggling right now and the cases are more acute. I know that that's when I last talked to Sue about even the, fo the foster care cases are coming down, but the cases are more acute. Um, 
And so I think that may be something that we all share in the different pockets or the circles that we are seeing is like, um, you know, some of the things that we're seeing are a little bit more acute than before. Um, this may can I ask a question about your first statement? Just so I know when you say providers, um, are you thinking about the whole array of providers sort of cherry picking or are you talking about residential providers? I'm thinking or are you just about, about this emergency? topic that Jennifer suggested being the residential placement. So there's and not. So, okay. So that's residential placement. And is it when you say residential placement, that means the emergency placement and all levels of placement. Okay. Thank you. I'm is that what you're wanting to focus or make sure that we're keeping a track on Jennifer? Is that accurate? Residential and specifically to emergency placements. Yeah. I mean, I think the reality is we've got providers who are not going to take Medicaid, those residential facilities that, you know, used to take some of our more difficult placements. Um, they're no longer some of them have stopped taking Medicaid altogether. There's a question I think about um, if others are going to follow suit. But then the other thing like we run into, um, like I said, with, with a case where we're, we're looking at possibly having to pay for the entire cost of the stay and residential can be really expensive. Um, and so CSA may potentially have to eat that whole cost if we can't find another placement for this child. Um, so it's just thinking about those pieces of it. And that, I mean, at least I feel like we're seeing where they're really um, not accepting some of the behaviors that they're saying that they treat children for, or the other thing is they'll accept them. And then when the kid displays that behavior, they discharge them. And so it's, it's challenging to, to figure out how to work with them um, when they do that. And then I just think the availability of, of beds capacity that because of the increase or what feels like the increase, um, there's no more space. Um, if, so what's used has been used. In the, um, we, our office just scanned 28 residential placements um, along the Eastern seaboard. And I would say at least a quarter to a third um, said outright, they'd love to take the student, but they, they don't have staff, that the great resignation has dramatically impacted their capacity. So, so there's beds, there's beds, but there's no staff to support the kids in those beds. So I wanted to throw that dynamic too, which has shocked me. Uh, I, I mean, not so much, but just to hear it personally, like, sorry, I, we can't, we'd love to, we have space, but we don't have staff. And that, that's been uh, incredible. So I, I just want to throw that dynamic out there too, that possibly there might, you know, as things change, but um, yeah. So thinking through like sort of locally, are there things that we can do in our circles of influence? Are there ideas that we can, throw and bounce off as far as like potential solutions that we're hearing other communities or localities are doing? Are there things that um, we're wanting to just share as far as some brainstorming solution time? And it could be from a, um, do we need to support the resources that we do have in this community differently? Is there training or vocational support, professional development that we can collectively support so that we can retain staff, so that they continue to have capacity? Do we need to, you know, the Jennifer's example that she said, you know, they say they treat certain behaviors, but when those certain behaviors are displayed, that all of a sudden is problematic. Is there some advocacy that we need to be doing as a CPMT or groups to um, support our local folks that are doing residential? Do we need to consider other alternatives? We have, I don't know if we do have like a virtual residential program locally. The first time I ever heard of that was last week. So can someone tell me what that is? The way that I understand it 
it, it would be like a foster home, but that has kind of like a crisis support component. Um, like somebody that's available that they can get on the phone if something comes up. So they might feel more comfortable accepting that kid knowing that they have like a hot, hotline or like another person who's gonna respond if something happens. That's my understanding of how it works. It's pretty, um, you know, the, whoever that provider is that's providing the support, the crisis support can be pretty intense um, in terms of like, they're available 24 seven or, you know, um, maybe or maybe not. Um, I think it can look different, however you need it to look, uh, but that's kind of my understanding of it. So I, I think that's a good description, Katie, and it's really not a new idea. I mean, it happened in the state, I don't know, a number of years ago, and it's really, it would really just be designed around one kid. And as you said, like in a, in a special living situation, but you basically have a wraparound, a crisis team around them, and it probably would be 24 hours a day. I can't recall the names of agencies that were in that business it's been so long ago uh, but it definitely was was something that happened and it's probably been over 10 years ago it's been a long time but it, you know it would you have to have that like immediate response um and how how somebody how a private provider did that would be a challenge but it, maybe it's not maybe it's possible with the right people i remember doing that with one of the youth I supervised that had joint involvement with Region 10 and maybe DSS. Um, but I feel like it was National Counseling Group, but I could be wrong about that. Who had offered it? I could be completely wrong, but because it's yeah. been a while. So Krista, I think around that same time, like I also remember a situation where Region 10 sort of partnered with community attention and kind of deployed staff into their program, uh, their residential program at that time. Um, as sort of similar to what Katie's talking about, being available by phone and then deployment. Um, I say that, but I'm losing staff by the day. I had staff back then. Yeah, I but I, I, there was that model in that program. I mean, we could look at potentially, I'm not saying Region 10 can do it again, because I'm having a workforce crisis, but we could, what about partnering with a local place like STARS? I mean, I know there's concerns, but could there be a similar partnership for an individual child where they're willing to have us send in, you know, something like that, or I don't, I'm just brainstorming, but if there's another local residential facility. Yeah, and I wonder no if that other problem is um, the kids' needs are too much for the group home criteria, and so the group home can accept them. I don't know about licensing and all that. Um, that that's why I'm thinking of a foster home, um, but... I think you're right, Katie. I think we would be asking the same places that are down on workforce, like Elk Hill, like if they're already down on beds because of workforce, they're not gonna be like, oh yeah, let's do some. I think looking at foster care and sending in people would be a better model, more feasible. I'm thinking about a situation I was just talking about this morning um, where it's a mom and a youth and they each have their own high level of needs, but one of which is a safe and stable housing and they burnt all their bridges with their family. And if that child comes into foster care, he won't do as well as he's doing with his mom. And if they, we could put them somewhere together, we might have a, a, a better shot at achieving uh, um, progress in a shorter time frame and for much less money than it's going to cost if we bring that child into foster care and he has to go into congregate care. I 
I don't know kind of what our next step is. You know, I don't know if we try to um, partner with private providers. I'm worried they might have <laughs> the same staffing issues like Region 10. I mean, my immediate thought was, you know, at one point in time, Region 10 had a crisis team and would they be able to do anything? But... And also, like, I think there's one specific next step that I think needs to happen is that we need to um, get the data. So if we can look, if there's a way to find out over this last year, how many times, how, how putting some numbers around the needs, so like how many times has, you know, for the Martha, Martha's example of the person and Louisiana that had to stay in a hotel for three days for lack of a bed. Can we put some numbers to how many cases over the last year um, that is? Because, you know, putting on a provider cap at this point um, is, it's really hard to develop a whole program or process or a procedure if it only happens one or two times. So you build all this scaffold, scaffolding, but Perhaps it doesn't meet the need. Um, the need doesn't meet the um, it, what it involves to put something together, if that makes sense. Um, so I think just doing like the first step is getting some data around that. Is that findable? I mean, I, I think I, I, you would have to go back because we're just talking about foster care, correct? Uh, when a kid comes into foster care, I don't. I don't know that it's necessarily just that because when I think about prevention, um, you know, when when prevention is maybe trying to find respite and they just can't, and then what do they do? Um, so there's a question about do some of those kids come into foster care because they couldn't come up with another plan? But again, like I can't speak to that specifically. I think you know what we'll probably have to do is go back to each individual agency and say. Can you think back to maybe how many times you, you've run into this? Um, but I think Misty has a good point that, you know, to try to create an entire program around something that may not happen that frequently, I don't know that that's really sustainable. And so, so, so the other challenge is, as a community, how can we, like, support these kids and families when maybe we can't afford to build a whole program around it, you know? And so... There's that challenge of figuring out, well, what do we do with that when, you know, maybe the data doesn't support, you know, we could, we could have a new A-home and we could have all these support services when, when the data just doesn't show the numbers that make that realistic. So then, so then what do we do? You know, if it's a service that you might access a couple of times a year, it's still, there's still value in it for us because it means that we get to keep these kids in our community and serve them here. But the trade-off is, it may not be financially sustainable. So, so there's that piece that you have to contend with as well. I wonder, um, just thinking too, if it's, if it's the, the same service that could be used for any potential placement disruption. Um, I wonder if that could also be part of the need, if we were to have something that could intervene at the point that a family is saying, this kid can't stay here anymore. Um, if it would help prevent any placement disruptions to you. What did you say, Katie? You wonder if you could have a process that would intervene what? Um, if we're talking about a service that could um, maybe provide some sort of virtual residential or crisis support um, to when a kid comes into care and needs residential and can't find it, if that same service could be used in a situation where the, there's a potential placement disruption and the kid could potentially go to residential then too. Um, just thinking if, if we're thinking about capacity, could it be used in that way as well? It sounds like also like we're speaking of residential broadly, but it sounds like there's a need for specific foster care placements in foster homes. There's a need for specific kinds of clinical beds for clinical stabilization. Um, there's what we're talking about is like respite 
residential where it's like, you know, they're, we just need a break to kind of regain our balance. Um, and, you know, so there's different kinds of residential. And so if we can, you know, continue to think about what, where it is that there, there is the most need or we can reach out to existing um, partners, existing providers that are providing that and asking them some questions to get some feedback about how often do you have to turn someone away and what are the reasons and what might be helpful. I also just randomly started getting um, emails with uh, a bed count from, I think it's somewhere in Richmond. Is anybody else getting those emails? Probably because you're the chair. Is so that you're, what you're, it is? Yeah. Like you're a special. On the, <laughs> you're on the OCS Only website. emails? Yeah. Like bed availability emails. That makes so much sense. Yes. We get those a lot. I get things from conferences, I guess, where I've given my information to. They'll send out bed counts. Well, that's interesting. So how would we like to move forward? Do, do we want to continue to discuss this next time? Is there to do an action that we can um, put some action to this? Is it possible to have some feedback next time about the numbers? Or is that too big a task? I mean, I think the question is whether you guys could go back to your respective agencies and try to, to get that information. I don't know that Katie and I really have a way to pull that from somewhere that I can think of. Yeah, I mean, I guess I was thinking it would be from, from the, each of the DSS agencies. Like the caseworkers would know if they're struggling to find a placement. Yeah, I mean, I think we could certainly get feedback. I don't know about like hard numbers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can definitely get, so I can bring something back. I'm not sure how specific it'll be. I mean, I know we had the one kid stay here a few nights and another we almost had stay here. We have, I mean, there's been actually several recently. Um, but I can get more specifics and bring it back. Some of those circumstances, or if that does happen and someone has to stay in a hotel or in an office space, you know, maybe thinking through that too. All right. So we'll just bring this topic back up next time to see if there's some additional information that we can consider and spend some time thinking about some potential solutions to that. Um, we have, do we have OCS communications? Yeah, we just had the one about the SPED wrap um, and it was basically just for those localities that don't use it, they lose it, but I don't think that applies to Charlottesville or Albemarle. Can I ask about the action on the, um, the, the data? Mary's going to get some some for Albemarle. Who's going to get it for Charlottesville? I I will, Lisa. I was just going to ask: Is it for a specific time? Like, do we want to ask in the last year or in the last quarter, or in your career? What are we? What are we for? <laughs> I guess how often does it come up? Uh, I'd say in. The last six months. Yeah. But I'm just throwing that out there. It's like a newish, a newish need. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Is the need though something that's happening? Is COVID having any um, impact for the need, or is this something we might have had some before COVID, or is the last six months going to tell the tale? And I don't know the answer. It's absolutely gotten worse over the past what? Would you say, Jennifer, six months or a year? Um, I mean, I, I can think back. And then we've had occasions before that where we've had concern about where a kid was going to go and finding a placement. But it was, I'm talking pre-COVID, it was nothing like it is now. 
I think the factors that we talked about, which is the um, what Kevin talked about, the workforce crisis right now okay. is COVID related for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and the acuity of uh, need of parents and families. I think everybody's under a tremendous amount of emotional, financial, physical stress. Um, and so that's gonna exacerbate the need. So that's another way to also just think about ARPA funds and how we might put some money behind additional resources or programs, initiatives, um, because it, I think it can be justified that it is COVID related and we can think through. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the dollars, but if it were about the dollars, just like Kevin's point, like we'd love to have them, but we don't have the people to work here. But it, there could be a way to invest or advocate for use of ARPA dollars to improve the circumstances of our kids, since it is, will likely be able to make the case that it's COVID related. I miss the days that it was just about the dollars. I have to say. <laughs> Thanks for keeping us on track, Lisa. Appreciate that. Um, we're up for Ms. Gallio. Program subcommittee update. How's program doing these days? Program is doing okay. Not much of an update really. Um, I know Jennifer mentioned the referral form that they we're putting together for um, the UR, the utilization review for mentoring. Um, so as soon as we have that together, I think we're ready to start making referrals. Um, and I'm not sure, I know I wasn't here last month and I'm not sure if we mentioned it, but we had talked about, we received the results of our first provider surveys. Um, we didn't have a great response to those. Um, and then the ones who did respond, a lot of them we think were rating their case manager more so than the provider. So we've been talking about um, changing some language um, in the survey to be a little more clear that it's the provider that they're rating. And I think Jennifer was gonna talk to someone, the lady who does the survey monkey, which I can never remember the name. It's actually Tamara, um, who's okay. in uh, DSS with the Office of Program Accountability. So Katie's actually the one that talked to her, so they were able to connect. Um, so we'll be bringing that to program for next month. She was able to give us some suggestions of what we could try to make it more clear, get better responses. All right, thank you both. Um, and I think that's about it. We're just moving along with those. Um, thank you. So there'll be an opportunity at a, a future CPMT meeting to get some of those responses, like we get the FAPT survey results. Will there be an opportunity to get that, or is that really just for agency use? I think we sent it last month. Okay. Did we? I think so. I think, I think so. Um, but yeah, so we are collecting the results quarterly. Um, hmm. Okay. The one that we sent out was through for October, November, December. Um, and then if we implement some changes, you know, it won't really affect this quarter, but maybe next quarter's results, we could, we could see if we're getting some different kind of responses. Thank you. All righty. So, um, before we do agency updates, um, we want to spend some time to stay accountable to look at our work plan. And uh, last month, um, I think what we had talked about that we were going to put on the agenda for this month is to take a closer look at goal five, which was reworded, correct? Yes. Um, and to spend some time sharing out, sharing out, sharing with each other about what each individual agency or individuals are doing um, to incorporate more diversity, inclusivity, uh, and equity practices in your organization. Okay. 
who would like to share something that they feel like has been effective or helpful in their own agency? Who would like to share first? Well, I'll say one thing that we just recently had a success on is Jenny Jones has been participating in job fairs at some of the MSW and BSW programs at historically black colleges that have accredited programs. And we just recently hired someone that um, talked to her at a job fair um, a while ago, like a year ago. And so it's been a slow payoff, but we're hopeful that that helps um, our relationships with, with those educational institutions and, and we can grow that. Fantastic. I'll follow up with Charlottesville Schools. Um, we are working with job fairs as well, and we would certainly welcome anybody you know who would like to join Charlottesville City Schools. And we can offer positions in just about everything starting now um, and for next school year. But we really are trying to look at the equity and diversity piece of that and um, with our recruitment plan looking at um, a wider array of colleges to look at, to look at a lot of the HBCUs and whatnot. We also do have a supervisor of equity who works to try to keep us honest on a lot of different things regarding equity and have a committee that's now looking at some of our policies to make sure that we are um, writing the policy, first of all, to include the, the aspects of equity and then to make sure our regulations will also follow that so that we are following what we, we have as policy. So you have somebody, a specific staff person that's designed to look at policies or you say that that's a, there's a committee that's looking at the policies? It's a, it's a committee. Uh, right now I, I am person responsible for policies, but in, in working with the, we work with the committee to look at some of the, the wording to make sure that it, says what we need it to say or what we mean for it to say. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's gonna be a long process. We won't get that done overnight because we want to look through quite a few of the policies. To, and then still to make sure that everything, the language that we all know has to be in for certain state and federal regulations is in there. We can't have it as sometimes as soft, not soft and really good word, but as user-friendly as we would like it to have when there's certain things it's got to, to have in there. So we're trying to find that balance. Thank you. <clears throat> so DJJ also has an equity work group and I serve on the state um, procedures committee that revises and evaluates all uh, procedures and we're getting our policies are now going through the equity committee before they come to us so that we get um, a lens about improvements and and how they can be more equitable. So that process is really just um, gearing up, but we <clears throat> meet monthly and are regularly now getting the um, the input from the equity committee. So we're appreciating their reviews. That's great. Is anybody, uh, we just had two uh, organizations talk about looking at policies and looking at language specifically or process specifically. Anybody, <laughs> is anybody else currently doing that policy re-editing, re -ed re-wording? Yeah. So Albemarle County has a um, equity checklist that goes with each policy. So we do a rotation just as part of our regular review, but as each policy is coming up, either new or revised, we, um, we require an equity checklist to go with it and really to deep dive into, you know, in intended purpose, unintended consequences, and then to review that with, um, a team before it goes to the school board. And that equity checklist is also part of the um, presentation to the school board. So that goes with every policy. Um, so that that is actively being done in Albemarle County Schools now. Kevin, could, could you share that equity checklist? We have a committee as well that looks at yeah. policy. Um, but you know they're kind of green about this, and I would love for them to have some guidance. Um, you know they're yeah. looking for language, but that deep dive, uh, I think, is something they're growing into and understanding. So I would love to see that. Yeah, I, I could forward it. I mean, it, it really is. It's a right. It's a skeleton of the process, but it, it prompts folks, and but then it's led by folks that have been 
trained in equity and diversity and, and that too, but I absolutely, I'll share it with the group. I was going to say, my reason for asking that is that I hear that a lot that folks are starting at a place of looking at policy and procedures with an equity lens. But at the same time, folks were also asking and looking for, is there a checklist? Is there like certain, how would you describe that lens and, and how, what are we looking for? What are, are there um, specific expectations that a policy would need to meet to be more equitable and inclusive. And so it'd be great if you could share that resource and what it uh, sounds like all three organizations that shared it so far has had an equity committee or an equity work group or an arm of some sort that does some vetting and, and looking first. Um, it'd be interesting also to see what training or how that group builds cohesion and what qualifies someone to be on the committee is what I'm saying. That would be also great to hear about too, like how those things got pulled together. Thank you. Oops, you going next, Nina? I saw you on mute. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, Region 10 um, as well has the equity, um, what we call the change team, where there is, um, it's our committee that is represents sort of across the agency um, addressing issues and getting input from staff that uh, don't you know don't necessarily feel safe to go to their bosses. Um, our position uh, we've had a DEI position for a year and a half. Uh, and that's been fantastic because there's so much trainings coming out of the department that we want to access. And sometimes there's too much training to have someone to organize it for our staff. I think almost all of our staff have been able to receive really good sort of 101 uh, racial equity uh, and inclusion sort of uh, training. So we have been able to do that. So that's been really successful. We've got the, the uh, review committee. One of the things I've been, that I think has been so successful is we're using social media in a different way that really puts out there our values around um, being a, a, an agency of anti-racism and it has made the staff so happy. Uh, not just the staff of color feeling appreciated, but all their allies and colleagues that want region tend to say those things. So that has been especially useful is embracing our Facebook page just to put that out there. So. Uh, other little things um, that have been, you know, a book club, um, built a library. Uh, the person, Jenny Bates, who's been in the position has been fantastic. Unfortunately, she got an opportunity she couldn't refuse, which was great for her, <laughs> but we'll be recruiting um, that she no longer is in that position. So we'll recruit again, which that's the, that's the Region 10 tagline. That's why I say when I walk into work every day is nobody tell me they had an opportunity they can't refuse. So. Well, thanks for sharing. Anybody else using social media to advocate or promote or to elevate the work? I'd say a little bit from the CAF perspective, I think they're looking through specifically recruiting more foster parents of color. And so they're, they're um, revamping even simple things like imaging um, to recruit more uh, foster families who are um, open and um, can be reflected in the, in the clients that we're serving. So even with, um, not just specifically to race, but age, gender, LGBTQ status, um, ability. So just even just something as simple as imaging is something that the CAF folks are thinking about. All right, anybody else wanna share? Uh, 
I'll say something that um, ironically, as we're having this discussion, um, my supervisor forwarded our, you know, Amor County has the Office of Equity and Inclusion and forwarded out our, the um, well-being and equity framework training that is happening here um, next week, I believe it is, and said, oh, this is a great, great session for everyone to attend. And we need to make sure we're continuing to work this equity into the budget process. I know it's a little bit different than, you know, some of the processes you're talking here, but it's kind of looking at that holistic framework and how um, making sure that we're using that to help guide departments and make sure they're thinking of things through that equity lens and, and all the policies and programs that they're putting forth um, for, for new funding or continued funding. So this, um, you said wellness and equity framework training? It's a well, well-being and equity framework. Um, it's community well-being and looking at it through um, an equity impact assessment framework. Um, it's- These are all really good words together. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what that, that means. There's no- um, Sure, and I was gonna ask more questions, but maybe you could share out what that framework uh, includes. You haven't attended the training yet, correct? No, that's it's not until next week. So I'll have to report back out at our, at our next meeting as to, to what exactly that means and entails. Yeah, the Office of Equity and Inclusion is actually coming to our staff meeting what day is this? Wednesday, tomorrow. Um, oh. And they're, they're talking about the this equity um, assessment tool. So I will know more tomorrow, but- um, Well, cause I was gonna ask is, does each department thinking of local government since several of us on this call are city local government, does each department get the same training or the same material or the same framework? No. <laughs> no. I mean, there's an, there's an overarching county framework, right? right. And we have an overall, um, Office of Equity and Inclusion that any and all of any department can reach out to and use their resources and have them um, come and work with us and engage with us. Um, but it looks different from department to department. That That's how I would perceive it. I don't know if you have a different perception, Ryan, but. No, I, I, I'd agree with that. I think they have kind of, like you said, that overarching equity framework and that they, they put out for that's more generalized that can kind of use that umbrella to catch every, everyone. And then as departments request it, they'll come in and um, specify their training specifically to the policies and practices that, that each department is looking at and dealing with. And so there is, you know, there's kind of a little bit of both. You have that general framework and then very specific. So there is some commonality to it, but it really does depend on what, what the department's needs are. And I can just say for DSS specifically, we've um, we've updated our with uh, well, we've updated our strategic plan to really focus on um, bringing uh, or, or working towards more diversity, not only in our workforce but in all the work that we do. Um, anti-racist, looking at anti-racism, intersectionality, um, and so on. So making it a really, it's a very robust goal with many. It's a very tiered and layered um, process um, with lots of layers uh, that gets at, you know, we have quarterly trainings in our staff meetings. We have every unit doing their own work. We have, um, we had a work group that um, just developed policies in terms of uh, recruit, um, improving and increasing um, equity in our recruitment processes and our hiring processes. So looking at all of our job descriptions and changing language, um, looking at our interview questions, um, where do we recruit? How do we, all of those things are in, um, are part of the recommendations for that that are going forward as well. So we're, we're trying to have a very multi-layered, um, multi-pronged approach and as well as um so anyway we'll see we're, we're still we're still working on it we feel like we've been working on it for a long time but i do think um i will say that it, i think it's been very helpful to have khaki come on board because um she has a lot of experience in this in in working in this arena and it's very helpful to have her expertise as we're moving forward so i i will say it's it's often helpful to have someone who um, has experience and expertise um, in this area to help 
guide guide the process because I think we were flailing a little bit before um, in, in terms of how just how to do all of this um, before we got her on board. So I'm glad you guys are getting some momentum. That's excellent. Um, I'd say from the human services community attention um, front, um, one of the things that we have done pretty consistently is small group um, conversations um, that for those of you guys who don't know, we have uh, about 45 employees, but we have CAF, we have our community-based uh, services unit, we have our admin and human services services. So uh, using, um, trying to pull different people from different like job uh, jobs and buildings to do the small group work. I don't know if anybody has done this curriculum, but it's called um, Dialogue on Race. Um, I think uh, Court Service Unit has done it or DJJ has done it. Um, uh, we've had two rounds of it in our department. Um, for me, um, for one of the learning moments that we had is, is really uh, kind of digging into this racial work is really personal. And I think a lot of what we're taught in white supremacy culture is to keep your personal and professional very separate, two distinct things. And so when it's kind of a culture shock when you start to bring your personal um, life and beliefs and thinking and experiences into the workforce. But uh, so that was a, a, a pretty big learning curve for our staff when we first started doing dialogue on race, because while um, there is an action plan component at the very end of it, um, there is a uh, just very in, like uh, personal um, sharing and, and experiential kind of learning that you do together. Um, so but I think it's very formative to kind of build that muscle of bringing more of your personal beliefs to get more integrated into your professional beliefs, because I think that's kind of one of the things that helps make it a little bit more sustainable. So um, if anybody wants some information on the every or the um, everyday democracy curriculum called Dialogue on Race and how it went with our department, I'm happy to share that information. All right, thanks for bringing that. I hope this can be a space where people share what's working. Um, and like you said, there's a lot of information out there and it would be really great if we could just vet some of those things and share them amongst our agencies about what's, what's going really well and learning from one another as we kind of challenge ourselves to do better in this arena ourselves with our new strategic plan goal. So this is a new thing for CPMT. Um, as our collective group. So um, it may get awkward, may get awkward, but we um, will lean in together and learn together. So, all right, we're gonna close with agency updates. Any news? I have some good news, I think. So, um, the as the Georgetown work is beginning to progress, we're going to um, have our first work group meeting for the technical violations, looking at the numbers of kids that um, get detained for probation or parole violations, and particularly with an equity lens, because we know that's a huge problem and we've known that for a while. So we had our first meeting this week and coming up and we have representatives from most of the agencies here um, on that work group and from some other community agencies too. So we're really excited about that. Um, we continue to get great support from Annie EKC. Um, the other thing I would say in relation to that work is that we've just completed um, a family engagement training that a number of you all were able to join us for too. We did six sessions and um, had some particularly challenging, a particularly challenging and helpful session uh, around the race equity issues. So um, that's been really helpful. And they're going to do one last extra session um, with all of the participants in a couple of weeks, well, maybe actually more like a month on self-care. So um, that's been a really good experience for us. The training's been done by Justice for Families and it's been really phenomenal. Other good news 
other announcements, other updates? I'll, I'll say we just pulled together some statistics for our calendar year 21 and 75% of our initial foster care placements were with kin or fictive kin. That was good. Wow. What did it you say, say average? about the placements? I missed. 75% of our initial foster care placements were with kin or fictive kin. And isn't the state average like 15%? I'm not sure for initial placements. Um, okay. Congratulations. That's all we get for good news. Come on now. Any other announcements? Things that you want um, us to share with our respective agencies or circles? Okay. In that case, I would like to adjourn this meeting. I hope you guys have a wonderful um, afternoon, evening. Take care of yourselves and each other. Thanks for signing on today. Bye, everybody.